is a story wrapped in myth and legend. How did a tribe of wandering nomads engineer the America's greatest empire in just 200 years? They had to devise engineering systems which were extraordinary for their age. Their civilization rivaled Rome in its sophistication. The Aztecs had the best technology that could be produced in the conditions of which they lived. Aqueducts, palaces, pyramids, and temples stood as a tribute to their gods and a testament to the power of humankind. The Aztecs' crowning achievement was a gleaming capital city that astonished European explorers called the Venice of the New World. The city spread out, glittering against its canals and its lake, bedecked with fine trees and beautiful mansions. Their thirst for power and blood set them on a course for destruction. When it finally came, their annihilation would be swifter and more complete than the world had ever known. Thirteen twenty five AD, Central Mexico, near modern day Mexico City. A young girl, just a teenager, is celebrating her impending wedding. She is the daughter of a tribal king, and she is about to join a new tribe that has been a guest of her kingdom. That tribe is now known as the Aztecs. As part of the ritual, five Aztec noblemen lead her to an ancient temple for the ceremony. But as she reaches the top, the noblemen suddenly veer her away from the altar and onto a slab of stone in front of the temple, one used for sacrifice. Each man holds a limb, while a fifth lifts an obsidian knife high in the air. With one searing move, he slashes it through her chest and extracts her still beating heart. That evening, the king is invited to a ceremony to celebrate the marriage. Instead, he finds a priest performing a dance, wearing the still glistening skin of his daughter. As part of the ritual, the Aztecs had flayed her to honor the god of fertility. He saw this, and he was absolutely horrified at what he saw, his dear daughter. And so he and his forces immediately chased the, the Aztecs into the lake and onto this island where they sought refuge. The marshy island was an unwelcoming place, yet it was from here that the Aztecs would beat the odds against them and forge the most powerful empire of the Americas. Hi, I'm Peter Weller. When I think of the Aztecs, I think of an elegant people with beautiful skin and flamboyant headdresses of many colors, and I think of floating cities and a terrific song by Neil Young about Moctezuma and Cortez. But I also think of knives, of obsidian glass ripping into chest cavities and hands, pulling out bleeding hearts and holding them high. Most of the Aztec sacrifices were performed in a temple atop a stone pyramid like this one. The Aztecs felt that without these offerings, the sun would literally cease to rise and the universe would die. Now, Aztec history is a fusion of fact and myth. But what we do know is that this murder, as horrific as it was, not only marked the beginning of the Aztec Empire, it also marked the location from where it would rise. The island the Aztecs were banished to after their disastrous sacrifice of the princess was in Lake Texcoco, the largest of five interconnected lakes covering a valley about 40 by 70 miles. Today, this once vast and open valley is teeming with what is modern-day Mexico City, one of the largest cities in the world. But 700 years ago, the island was so swampy 
no one had laid claim to it. Now as they gazed on the lake, the Aztec leader Tenoch announced to his followers that he had seen an eagle perched on a cactus in the middle of the lake, a sign from the gods that they had found their new home. They would name their city Tenochtitlan. Life is tough for the Aztecs in the early days of Tenochtitlan, but they have a vision. A vision of a powerful city modeled on an ancient and legendary city just 25 miles away. They called this city Teotihuacan, or City of the Gods. We know very little about Teotihuacan because all we have is the archaeological remains. We don't have any writing, we don't have any documentation that, that really fleshes out what went on at this big city. It was in ruins even in Aztec times, but they believed it to be the stomping grounds of the gods and the literal birthplace of the sun itself. The place the Aztecs most revered in Teotihuacan was a pyramid that rose above the tree line. It was called the Pyramid of the Sun. The massive Sun Pyramid contains a million cubic yards of earth and stone, with a base roughly the same as the Great Pyramid of Giza in Egypt. The Aztecs believe Teotihuacan was laid out in the image of the cosmos created by their gods. Now it was this image they would attempt to replicate in the construction of their new city, Tenochtitlan. Taking on the challenge would be an Aztec leader named Acamapichtli. In 1376, he embarked on an ambitious plan to engineer an advanced city at Tenochtitlan. But there was a problem. The swampy islands that they took over needed a lot of work. When they started to build anything, it would begin to subside. There was simply no foundation on which to build. The Aztec solution would revolutionize the architecture of the Americas. They began by anchoring their buildings deep in the ground using a system of pilings made from wood. Workers cut stakes into 30-foot lengths, three to four inches wide. These were driven into the soft ground to make a foundation. The pilings were often surrounded with volcanic stone to add strength. Masons and bricklayers could then build walls on top of this base with confidence. They have found wooden pylons to hold the foundations of the, of the pyramids. The fact that they didn't sink or the fact that it didn't just topple. I think that's a major feat of engineering. Tenochtitlan was an island city, but the lakes surrounding it were very shallow, sometimes only seven feet deep. The whole thing looked like a giant metroplex floating on a pond. Originally, the only way to get from this floating city to the mainland was by boat. But the Aztecs eventually devised a series of causeways, sometimes 45 feet wide, that would connect their floating city to the mainland provinces. The causeway was supported by strong wooden pilings, the same pilings that supported their temples and other buildings. Thousands of these pilings had to be driven deep into the lake bed, and this presented a logistical challenge that could only be met by a strong, skilled labor force and the best of Mesoamerica's engineers. To build a causeway, two lines of stakes were laid out. Then the space between them was filled with stones and earth until it reached several feet above the water level. This allowed the road to support enormous weight. These causeways were built very straight, uh, they were very wide, with bridges that would open up uh, that connected the city to the north, to the west, and to the south. The roads enabled the Aztecs to transport larger, heavier materials for building. But this presented a new challenge. There were no beasts of burden in Mesoamerica, so everything had to be done with humans. No carts, no wheel. Small loads would be carried on the back with a rope hung from the forehead. Large items like stone blocks or sculptures for a temple would be dragged by huge numbers of men pulling ropes, possibly using logs as rollers. Legend has it one stone bound for a temple required a force of 50,000 men to drag it from the mountains on the mainland, across the causeway, and into the city. 
The causeways would also present the Aztecs with a new way to get fresh water to Tenochtitlan. In the past, the Aztecs had transported water in canoes from the shore. But a huge boom in the city's population meant they needed a higher tech solution to keep up with demand. They wanted to use water from the springs on the mainland, and so they wanted to build an aqueduct. But the springs were under control of the dominant tribe in the region, the ruthless Tepanics. The Tepanics were the controllers or the dominators of all the valley. They had a, a, a very strong empire. So they were the lords of the valley. So the Aztecs were tributary subjects to them. As the Aztec population grew, tensions with the Tepanics began to simmer. Now the Aztecs decided to issue an ultimatum that could change the balance of power in the region. The people of Tenochtitlan not only demanded that the Tepanex give them the water, but also demanded that they help construct the aqueduct. The Tepanex answer was swift and brutal. The Tepanex king, Maxtala, sent assassins who murdered the reigning Aztec leader in cold blood. This was the final straw. After decades of domination, the Aztecs would finally make their move and wage war against their ruthless overlords. And they would launch a series of wildly ambitious building projects around their growing island city that would earn them a reputation as the greatest engineers of the Americas. It is 1428, and the Aztecs have declared war on their overlords, a tribe called the Tepanecs. But to defeat the Tepanecs, they would need a little help from their neighbors. The Aztecs approached the nearby city-state of Texcoco. There, a decisive leader was on the rise. His name was Coyotl and his domineering leadership would be instrumental in forging the Aztec Empire. With Coyotl at their side, the Aztec underdogs would go for the jugular. They launched an all-out attack on the Tepanec capital. After a siege of more than 100 days, they broke through Tepanec defenses and slaughtered their oppressors. After capturing the Tepanec king, Maxtla, King Netzwalcoyotl personally cut out his heart and sprinkled his blood into the waters of Lake Texcoco. Suddenly, the tables had turned. That is the exact moment of the beginning of the empire, and the Aztecs became the leaders of the Valley of Mexico. After conquering the Valley of Mexico, the Aztecs could now turn their attention to bringing clean water to their growing city. Remarkably, the Aztecs would independently design and build something that only a few world empires would master, the aqueduct. The aqueduct actually had two channels, each about five feet high and three feet wide. One would be cleaned and maintained, while the other was being used so the water flow was never interrupted. The twin tube aqueduct ran for three miles from the mainland to the center of the island city. In town, water streamed into public fountains and reservoirs and was distributed to the public in large clay jars or by canoe. In comparison to the Europeans, the Aztec were a very clean people. We know that the Aztec emperor bathed twice a day, so in terms of hygiene, the Aztec people uh, was much more advanced than the Europeans. While the Aztec nobles were bathing in luxury, at this time in Europe, plague caused by unsanitary conditions was killing millions. King Netzwalcoyotl's own bath was one of the most unique in the Americas. It was fed by a sophisticated aqueduct system that also brought running water to his palace grounds. Behind me is the hill of Tezcozinco. And on this hill, Nezahualcoyotl built a fantastic pleasure palace. And around this palace, a virtual botanical garden filled with all of the exotic flowers of Mesoamerica. 
Nezawa Kyoto brought water from the Sierra Nevada mountains all the way down to here, into this hill, to his palace, just to water his plants. To install an aqueduct there, Netzwal Coyotl had to fill a huge gorge between Tetzcocinco and the next hill. As the water arrived at the first hill, it gathered in small pools built to control the speed of the flow before it reached the aqueduct. After crossing the aqueduct, the water ran in a circuit around Tetzcocinco Hill, spilling off over the sides in rock-cut waterfalls to water the gardens. It ended up in a nearly perfectly round rock-cut pool called the King's Bath. And from here, he could look upon his domain at Texcoco, and he could look down at the botanical gardens that he was watering with his fantastic aqueducts. It is indeed a bath fit for a king. By the mid-15th century, with their empire on the rise, it was time for the Aztecs to choose a sovereign leader. He was called Moctezuma, and he would be the first of two emperors with this now famous name. Moctezuma's first order of business was to extend the empire's borders. The Aztecs captured city-states southward to the valley of Oaxaca, westward to the Pacific, and east toward the Gulf of Mexico. By 1449, the empire contained as many as 15 million people. In the short span of 100 years, the Aztecs accomplished the impossible. They had toppled the Mesoamerican world order. But while the Aztecs dominated militarily, their island city was vulnerable to a different kind of enemy. Like New Orleans, Tenochtitlan was constantly doing battle with water. And one of Moctezuma's first projects was to protect his city from the deluge of water surrounding it. This is what is left of Lake Xochimilco, in the southern part of Mexico City in Aztec times, the city of Tenochtitlan. This lake, like the other four lakes that surrounded the city, were spring-fed. Thus, there were no rivers or streams into which it could drain. And if it rained hard enough, the water would rise up and sweep over the land and into the city itself. And this is exactly what happened in the mid-1400s when a flood of catastrophic proportions swept into Tenochtitlan. The city and the empire it commanded were almost completely destroyed, and the Aztec civilization had to once again rely upon the genius of its engineers, and one engineer in particular. Moctezuma enlisted the help of his old ally, Netzwalcoyotl, to protect the city he was rebuilding from the lake. Netzwalcoyotl would design a solution that would make him the greatest engineer on the continent. His plan was to create a safe zone around the city with a huge dike that would protect Tenochtitlan and its inhabitants. It was designed to be larger than any earthwork anywhere in the Americas at the time, running for 10 miles just east of the city from the southern edge of the lake across to the north. The walls were a wickerwork construction made of sticks, reeds, stone, and earth. Since the lake was shallow, the dike was only about 12 feet in height, but some 27 feet wide. Netzwalcoyotl fitted the dike with sluice gates, most likely wooden doors that would be raised or lowered to control the water level behind it. The dike also served another purpose. It protected their water supply. It was important to build some sort of protective mechanism to keep salt water out of the freshwater western part of the lake. An army marches on its stomach, so said Napoleon. Now an ample food supply for civilians is a no-brainer in the critical development of any civilization. But the Aztecs perfected a unique method, not only to provide a substantial food supply for its civilian populace, but to fuel the military expansion of its empire. This revolutionary engineering was called chinampas, a system that allowed them to literally create new land to farm and to live on. If you're going to have a city of any size, you have to provide room for them. And so what they did was build up these chinampas in the lake bed. 
basically Ichinampa is an artificial island built in the lake. They look like narrow football fields, about 300 feet long by about 30 feet wide. A chinampa was built by weaving a web of sticks floating in the water and piling reeds on top of them. Mud was then scraped from the lake bottom and piled atop the reeds to form the chinampa. It took four to six men eight days to build the average chinampa. They were connected to the city by massive navigational canals that would take thousands of men months to build. A chinampa like this one could produce up to seven crops a year, whereas a farm on the mainland could yield one, maybe two, maybe three at the most. As a crop was ready to harvest on a chinampa, seedlings from another would be sprouting out of mud that would be spread on a boat adjacent to the chinampa. Then when the seedlings were ready, they'd be transported to the chinampa, and this cycle would be repeated over and over and over again on hundreds and then thousands of chinampas. Now, it was this technology that transformed Tenochtitlan from just another tribal town in the 14th century to a dominant and thriving city-state. With their city's infrastructure in place and vast lands under their control, the Aztecs would push the boundaries of their empire further than ever before. They'd create a far-flung network of roads, Aztec superhighways. But as the empire grew, so too did their practice of human sacrifice. Soon, rivers of blood would be flowing through the streets of Tenochtitlan. Today, Tenochtitlan, the capital of the Aztec Empire, is gone, buried under modern-day Mexico City. But 700 years ago, it was a shining capital on the rise, built by advanced engineers and led by larger-than-life emperors. By the late 15th century, the Aztec population had exploded. Their next great emperor would launch a series of conquests that would rival anything in world history. His name was Ahuitzotl, and he would prove to be an even greater warrior than his grandfather, Moctezuma. By 1502, Ahuitzotl had conquered territory from Mexico's Pacific coast and pushed the empire as far south as Guatemala. His reign was kind of like a golden age. He was a king that opened up transport routes to the coastal areas and to lowland areas where the Aztecs got their greatest luxuries, these shimmering tropical feathers, the gold, the precious stones that the, the nobles and rulers wore as symbols of their station in life. To transport riches to the heart of the empire, the Aztecs constructed a network of superhighways throughout central Mexico. Relay runners were stationed every few miles to create a sort of ancient Federal Express. Messages or goods could be sent 200 miles from the Gulf Coast to Tenochtitlan in just 24 hours, faster than the Postal Service today. With the empire at its height, the Aztecs under Ahuitzotl embarked on their greatest construction project, a massive pyramid at the very center of Tenochtitlan, the symbol of their absolute power. It was called the Templo Mayor, or Great Temple. The base of the pyramid was 240 feet deep by 300 feet wide and rose to a height of 15 stories. There were at least 117 steps in two staircases climbing 200 feet, leading to twin temples to honor the gods of rain and war. The temple was rebuilt on the same location seven times, beginning in 1325 with the city's founding. As the empire grew, so did the pyramid. Each stage was simply built right on top of the stage before. The Temple Mayor was built mainly uh, with a stone called Tezontli, that is uh, volcanic stone. It's a very light weight stone. That would uh, prevent the sinking of the, of the temple. For floors and walls, the Aztecs applied a lime plaster, which was a form of concrete. Some examples found today remain as hard as modern concrete, 
even after 500 years. Aztec workers labored for decades to complete their monument to the gods. The temple remained buried until 1978, when power company workers digging a trench accidentally uncovered a huge carved stone and discovered the temple ruins next to it. The disk, 11 feet in diameter, weighs 8 tons and depicts the dismembered body of the goddess Koyoshalkwi. Koyoshalkwi was the moon goddess, but her brother murdered her because she became pregnant in a very shameful way. Now, the Aztecs weren't prudes by any means. Matter of fact, nobles had many wives and concubines, but amongst the commoners, particularly women, adultery was a no-no and severely punished, often by death. So according to legend, the moon goddess's brother cut her head off, and after he decapitated her, he shoved her body down a hill. The Aztecs reenacted this killing literally and frequently in festivals throughout their calendar year. They would decapitate their victims at the top of a pyramid like this and then push the carcasses down the steps to the great stone at the bottom. For the Romans, their most precious treasure was gold. For the Egyptians, it was the afterlife. For the Aztecs, it was human blood. They felt a sense of reciprocity with the gods, so they needed to give a thanksgiving to the gods, giving the most precious thing they had that was human blood. The Aztecs called it precious water, and they believed that if the gods didn't receive it in massive quantities, the world would end in apocalypse. It was common practice to adorn the walls of the insides of the temples with fresh human blood. And the smell must have been appalling. To dedicate his expansion of the great temple, Emperor Awitzotl held a mass sacrifice. The heads of victims were displayed prominently on skull racks around the temple. According to some uh, chronicles, they say that there were sacrificed 20,000 people. From a practical point of view and from a scientific point of view, it sounds impossible. So I think that the chronicle that is written by Spanish sources is basically telling us that to their eyes, they were many. As Awid Zotl's reign continued, the bloodletting skyrocketed. Life in Tenochtitlan soon became an orgy of death. Friends and enemies alike would be brought in to witness the, the sacrifices. It's always ritual, sacrifice is always a ritual event, but it was also a political statement, and it was a, kind, a form of intimidation. By the time of Awitzotl's death, the Aztecs had institutionalized sacrificial killing and turned killing on the battlefield into an art form. They were the America's fiercest fighters, an elite cadre of whom would have a spectacular new mountainside temple dedicated to them. But even they were not prepared for the war of the worlds that was about to descend upon them. Fifteen o two, Awitzotl, Emperor of the Aztecs, is dead. Moctezuma the second, a thirty-four-year-old former priest, comes to power. A world away in Spain. An 18-year-old notary named Hernán Cortés is preparing to cross the Atlantic to join in his country's conquest of the New World. This is the zenith of the Aztec Empire. It now covers at least 80,000 square miles, reaching out from Tenochtitlan to both coasts and as far south as Guatemala. Some 25 million people are subject to Aztec rule. 38 provinces, containing innumerable city-states, are paying them heavy tribute, making the emperor and nobles fabulously rich. The city spread out, glittering against its canals and its lake, bedecked with fine trees and beautiful mansions. And Moctezuma II presided over it all. He was known for his statesmanship and military skills. A tough leader, he slaughtered the population of towns that wouldn't bend to his rule. 
but privately, he was troubled. It seems that Moctezuma was a passive individual, perhaps even a depressive individual. Legend says that when he witnessed a comet streaking across the skies over Tenochtitlan, he spent the rest of the night in tears. As the weeks went by, he became increasingly paranoid. But at the height of his obsession with the supernatural, a very real threat approached from across the sea. Spies posted along the Gulf Coast reported strange sightings offshore that they were at a loss to describe. They never have seen a boat, so they didn't even have a word to, 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 to describe that. So the Indians referred to those boats as mountains that move in the water. In 1519, after sailing from Cuba, Cortez landed with 11 of these floating mountains and 500 men on the Gulf of Mexico, 200 miles southeast of Tenochtitlan. The tribes were astonished by these men with metal armor and animals they had never seen. As he moved inland, tribes who resisted were brutally slaughtered, but many others were happy to provide him with provisions and men. One of the ways in which one local lord down on the Gulf Coast curried favor was to give Cortez and his company a group of women who were to not only provide for them in housekeepers sort of manner, but were also clearly meant to be courtesans as well and provide sexual services to them. But among the concubines, one in particular caught the eye of Cortez himself. She was the daughter of a chieftain who had been sold into slavery and was called La Malinche. They developed an intimate relationship and in time she bore a son to him. And he would have been one of the first people of mixed blood in the new world. But she was much more than a mistress. She became an interpreter for Cortez and her role expanded to advisor and intermediary between him and the Aztecs. Not only was she his translator, but she could also tell him about things that were being said that he was not intended to hear or understand. Moctezuma's network of relay runners kept him apprised of the Spaniards' movements. It was clear they were headed for his city. As he advanced toward Tenochtitlan through the summer of 1519, Cortez amassed an army of thousands. Moctezuma's army of warriors numbered in the hundreds of thousands. They wore animal costumes on the battlefield to intimidate their opponents. Part of it was spectacle. You had just incredible costumes that the different warriors would wear. The most important warriors were knights, dressed as jaguars and eagles. The Aztec knights were initiated into their orders at sacred ceremonies at special temples like this one. This is the cave temple at Malinalco, one of six temples on this remote mountainside a few hours south of Mexico City. It was finished by Moctezuma II around 1502, shortly after his coronation. Now over in Europe, Michelangelo was pounding out the David for the Republic of Florence. But while Michelangelo was carving the David, the Aztecs were here carving this temple right out of the side of this mountain. And it is the only temple in the entire Western Hemisphere built in this manner. At the bottom of the stairs of Kualcali are the sculptures of two jaguars. On each side of the door, there are the remnants of two warriors. Now the door itself represents the open mouth of a giant serpent. You can literally see its tongue coming out of the room. The Aztecs believed that this was the entrance to the womb of the earth. Now the privileged warriors would come here, go into the room with sculptures of eagles, have their noses pierced, and offer blood and sacrifice to Huitzilopochtli, the god of war. But this would be by no means the last time these Aztec warriors would spill their blood. The first meeting between Cortez and Moctezuma 
would be peaceful, but the conquistador knew a huge and bloody clash between the old world and the new would soon take place. And the annihilation that ensued would become one of the most frightening events in the history of the Americas. It is the fall of 1519. Spanish conquistador Hernán Cortés has finally reached the gleaming Aztec capital he has heard so much about, Tenochtitlan. When the Spaniards first saw Tenochtitlan, they thought they were in some kind of an enchanted vision. They thought they'd entered some kind of a dream. A massive force of native warriors allied against the Aztecs accompanies him as he advances on the main causeway into the city. The meeting of Cortes and Montezuma on a causeway approaching Tenochtitlan had to be one of the most remarkable events in world history. It's really a, a, a meeting of two different worlds. And Cortes offered his hand, but the minute he started to do that, to actually touch Montezuma, the noble attendants around Montezuma pushed Cortes away and said, no, 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 that's, that's a total indignity. Nobody touches Montezuma, the great lord of the land. The meeting of the two worlds was peaceful, but fraught with tension. Montezuma by this time had become increasingly impulsive and prone to bouts of hysteria. So the encounter was a, an, an encounter of, of sensing the, the, the forces no, in each side. But the Aztecs had a diplomacy and a warfare system that was somewhat naive in comparison to the very tricky and sly system of the Europeans. Moctezuma invited the Spaniards to stay in one of his palaces. It would prove to be a catastrophic mistake. As the Spaniards entered the city, they were so awed they thought they were dreaming. At the heart of the city stood the emperor's colossal palace. The palace of Moctezuma II was a massive complex spread across six acres near the great temple. One of the Spaniards noted that every day at Moctezuma's palace, 600 nobles gathered and they would hear the word of their emperor. Moctezuma received the Spaniards in a large reception chamber just beyond the main entrance, designed to make the emperor appear omnipotent. But Moctezuma's palace would be the last ever built by the Aztecs. Not a week into their visit, the Spaniards went for the jugular, kidnapping Moctezuma. It was an audacious move, but it paid off. The empire appeared to be theirs. Even though Moctezuma was still the official leader of the city, it was, he was really, for some time, nothing more than a mouthpiece for Cortes. For six months, tensions within the walls of Tenochtitlan slowly simmered. Then, in the spring of 1520, it all came to a head. One morning, Spanish soldiers interrupted a sacred sacrifice and slaughtered those taking part. The move sparked an uprising. For the Aztecs, the Spaniards had committed an unspeakable sacrilege. The city became engulfed in chaos as the Aztecs marched on Moctezuma's palace. Moctezuma gets up on the top of the palace and tries to talk to the people and calm them down, and by now they're just not having any of it. Moctezuma had become nothing more than a Spaniard's puppet, a betrayal so great in the eyes of his people they pummeled him with rocks and arrows. Shortly after, Moctezuma's lifeless body was tossed from the palace walls. Whether he died at Spanish hands or from injuries inflicted by his own people may never be known. And the Spaniards at that point decide this would be a, probably a good time to leave the city. On the night of June 30th, 1520, the Spaniards attempted to escape under cover of darkness but they can't separate themselves from the plunder that they've gotten so far. So they're weighted down with all of the things that they want to take with them. They were easy targets for the Aztec warriors who caught them on the causeway. 
bodies quickly piled up in the water. 400 Spaniards were killed along with several thousand of their Indian allies. That escape has, has come to be called the Noche Triste, the sad night. Cortez and a few others managed to escape with their lives. The Spaniards would now destroy the shining city of Tenochtitlan for good. He would begin by severing the lifeblood of the city, the aqueduct. As hundreds of thousands of people within the city's walls were without water, Cortez created a blockade around Tenochtitlan to cut off all outside supplies of food. So the idea of this uh, blockade was to try to, sur to make surrender the city by hunger. And the Aztecs had a tremendous resistance, so they couldn't be defeated easily. And what they decide to do is to mount a, an attack both by land and by sea. For centuries, the lake around Tenochtitlan was a barrier against invaders. But Cortez would find a way around that. He had thousands of his Indian allies carry ships in pieces up thousands of feet over the mountains to be assembled and launched into the lake. May 1521. Cortez unleashes his massive army in a final decisive attack on Tenochtitlan. 600 Spaniards, including 100 cavalrymen and upwards of 50,000 of their Indian allies, clash with the Aztec defenders of the city on its grand causeways. Brutal fighting continued for months. Day by day, Cortez raised the city block by block. He and his Indian allies were merciless in their systematic slaughter of the population. It was an extremely hard fought battle, especially in the city precincts. The Aztecs made a last stand at the great temple in Tlatelolco. Warriors lined the steep steps to rain down arrows and rocks on their enemy. But it was hopeless. On August 13th, the final Aztec leader, Cuauhtémoc, was captured and surrendered to Cortez. And that was just the beginning. 20 million would die of disease brought by the Spaniards. By the end of the 16th century, we estimate that the native population had been reduced by about 90 percent. Modern-day Mexico City has been built atop the rubble of the once majestic city of Tenochtitlan. The Spaniards leveled it during the construction of their own colonial capital, even using stones from the great temple to build their cathedral still standing next to the temple ruins. The Aztec Empire had vanished, and with it, a legacy of astonishing engineering achievements. It has become clear from their sophisticated systems of urban planning, agriculture, and waterworks that the Aztecs stood among the most advanced of the world's great empires. The cave temple here at Malinalco is one of the few truly impressive Aztec achievements that the Spanish did not destroy. And stunning sights such as this beg the tantalizing question, if the Spanish had not come, what would Mexico Deep within the jungle. We're talking about a civilization discovered in the middle of a rainforest. Cryptic remains of a lost civilization, one that spanned a continent for more than a thousand years. They definitely had attributes of the supernatural. They were the ancient Maya. Their rulers filled vast cities with sky-high pyramids, ornate palaces, and lavish plazas. They were masters of their environment. They were very resourceful in figuring out how to harness the energy, creating amazingly sophisticated works of art and engineering, and sustaining a civilization for 1,500 years. Then, after generations of prosperity and innovation, the ancient civilization collapsed, turning bustling cities into ghost towns to be reclaimed by Mother Nature. Centuries later, answers to the mystery surrounding these majestic people and the godlike kings who ruled them tell a story of conquest, ingenuity, and disaster.
869 AD, in the lowlands of the Guatemalan jungle, the Maya are becoming desperate. Food and clean water are dwindling. Thousands of people are starving. And malnutrition and disease are ravaging the population. The Maya no longer trust their divine rulers to appease their gods. Political turmoil plagues the kingdoms, and one by one the great city-states are being abandoned. The ancient Maya civilization is crumbling. City after city, area after area begins to fail. Cities are abandoned, kings disappear, um, and what had been classic Maya culture really comes to an end. What happened to this great people? Even today, scholars are still mystified. We know that people began to disappear. The question is, how did that happen? The answer may lie in complex hieroglyphics known as the Maya Code. A hieroglyph is a complex way of uh, conveying all the information that Maya people could think or express. And it's the only example in the Americas of a complete, complex system of writing. Today, these cryptic symbols reveal a history of brutal warfare, larger-than-life rulers, and the rise and fall of an enigmatic people. Hi, I'm Peter Weller, and I'm standing on top of this beautiful temple deep in the rainforest of southern Mexico near the border of Guatemala, and this is the heart of the civilization of the ancient Maya. For years, archaeologists believed that the ancient Maya were peacefully separated into 40 or so independent city-states, each with their own dynasty of kings. For what we could tell, there seemed to be trade, communication, but there didn't seem to be any particular imperial aggression motivated by a thirst for land or power outside of a king's own territory. But in the last half century, these theories are starting to fly in the face of a different story because hieroglyphs like this one, the remnants of the ancient Maya's advanced writing system, are painting a whole new picture. The touchy-feely 1960s and new age ideas of a gentle and loving people are being fast replaced by a much more complex reality of city-states butting heads in bloody clashes. And now we have evidence that brutal battles and human sacrifice were fundamental components of life among the ancient Maya. But the evolution of the Maya civilization into this complex network of city-states didn't happen overnight. The Maya came into existence probably a couple of thousand years before Christ. By 500 BC, population was on the rise, and small communities were turning into the first major Maya sites located throughout Central America. Fully organized kingdoms were ruling the region by 250 AD, with mighty rulers at the helm. They had um, powerful rulers, they were in competition with each other, and sometimes this competition led to war. For the Maya, it was war led by kings in the name of the gods. Maya kings were people like us, but for the Maya, they definitely had attributes of the supernatural. The price of devotion had brutal and sometimes deadly consequences. People owed a blood debt to the gods. It wasn't that they didn't regard human life or human blood highly. Quite the contrary. Human blood and human life was the most precious, the most sacred thing that could be offered to the gods in order to repay the blood debt that was incurred at creation. Bloodletting and human sacrifice dominated the king's strategic thinking. They picked allies and attacked neighbors, all with an eye on appeasing their deities and staying autonomous. Unlike Rome, in the case of the Maya, we're not dealing with one empire. Instead, we're dealing with a series of rival kingdoms. By the third century AD, Maya civilization was flourishing. No one city ever succeeded in dominating all the others. But one seat of power was on the rise. Its name was Tikal. Tikal is one of the few cities that goes strong in the pre-classic period, before the time of Christ and then it just continues pretty much unabated all the way until the end of the classic period. This is a city that never really lost it. But in the sixth century, a rival power named Kalakmul threatened Tikal's success. The Maya 
had these two great dynastic capitals, Kalakmul and Tikal. Those two cities essentially locked horns. It's really Kalakmul that seems to engage in this action in which they engineer alliances all the way around Tikal, essentially boxing in their enemy. It would be up to an ambitious and visionary leader to build a center of military power, one that would take on Kalakmul. His name was Yikin Khan Kawil. He would construct one of the most iconic structures of the Maya, a pyramid that would stand the test of time, the Temple of the Giant Jaguar. The most valuable monument was one that took a lot of effort. So a big temple pyramid is an indication of your power, your strength, your prestige. It's a way of drawing people into your city because it shows what an awesome, powerful ruler you are. Building in semi-tropical environments with rudimentary materials was a unique challenge, especially when the goal was to build vertically using Stone Age technology. Most of the technology that we associate with big stone constructions were unknown to the Maya. They did not have beasts of burden. They didn't have metal tools. What the Maya did have was a virtually unlimited supply of malleable limestone and a great deal of manpower. Your labor was one of the things that you were required to give to the king on an annual basis. Blocks of limestone were quarried and then pushed, pulled, or carried by sheer force to the construction site. They used something that we call the tump line, and this is a rope that would pass around the forehead, and in that, they could carry, literally at times, hundreds of pounds of debris. Level by level, the pyramid was built skyward. Wooden scaffolding supported the laborers and the structure as it expanded. Skilled masons shaped the limestone with stone tools and wooden mallets. Though the interior was filled with unrefined rubble, the exterior was deceivingly manicured, covered in a strong mortar known as Maya stucco, and painted red. Even though they knew of the wheel, even though they knew of metal, they elected not to make practical use of either of these things. And I think in part, it was because in their worldview, something was much more valuable if a lot of human labor went into it. At nearly 150 feet, the Temple of the Giant Jaguar emerged, facing west toward the setting sun. The ancient skyscraper would command the attention of all who set foot in Tikal's Grand Plaza as a symbol of power and redemption. But Yikin Khan Kawil's engineering marvel was just the beginning. In 736, Kawil had defeated his ultimate rival, Kalak Mool. Then, in 743 and 744, he attacked and eviscerated two critical Kalakmul allies that surrounded Tikal, El Peru to the west and Naranjo to the east. Finally, the suffocating noose that had once strangled Tikal was broken. In celebration of this, he builds a, a whole series of, of major expansions to the palace, uh, new pyramids, and when we look at Tikal today, in many cases, we're looking at the fruits of that success. He may have even launched the construction of the tallest of Tikal's structures, Temple 4. Made of 250,000 cubic yards of stone, the massive pyramid stretched more than 210 feet, or 22 stories high, nearly as tall as the towers of the Brooklyn Bridge. It jutted far above the dense rainforest canopy, with a 180-degree view of the city. In the distance, other Maya cities were also ambitiously building toward the sky. But at this moment, with King Yakin Khan Kawil at the helm, Tikal was the unchallenged powerhouse of the Maya civilization. But Tikal was not alone. Out of sight, about 250 miles to the west, another dynasty is forging the construction of a great acropolis. There, in the seventh century, a king with a vision would emerge. He would turn one of the wettest cities in the world into a mecca of new world architecture.
611 AD, on the outskirts of the Maya world in southeast Mexico, a city by the name of Palenque is on the ropes. It launches a last-ditch defense against regional powerhouse Calakmul. Palenque's forces are overwhelmed, and the king is killed with no male heir to the throne. Because Maya kings were thought to be divine lords, their lineage is key to survival. The end of a dynasty usually spelled disaster. Yet at this critical moment, one of the greatest building campaigns in Maya history was about to begin in Palenque, and the king behind it would remain unknown until the middle of the 20th century. In 1949, some of the questions regarding the mysterious dynasty of Palenque are answered when archaeologist Alberto Ruz Lulle is excavating this 75-foot high temple now called the Temple of the Inscriptions. Now, I'm in pretty good shape, but those guys had headdresses and big robes, obsidian knives and swords. I thought I'm in pretty good shape, for an old guy anyway. But I don't know how they did it. And I don't know how Alberto Rousselier did it. But I still got a lot to go. And when he gets up into the sanctuary, he looks around. And he notices on the floor a row of holes covered with stone stoppers. And he figures out that these holes were made for ropes in order to pull up the slab, just like I'm on a trap door. So he pulls up the slab, this one exactly, and he follows a steep staircase filled with dirt and debris. He's never seen a Maya pyramid like this before. So his men start digging and digging and digging into the unknown. The wet stairs are very slippery from the moisture and time and the rain from the forest, and he finally gets down to a plateau. And he notices that the whole pathway doubles back and then continues, and he finds hidden doors, secret passageways, signs that a lot of thought and calculation went into building this structure. Finally, after three years, after three long years, he gets to the bottom of this 80-foot stairway, and there he sees a small corridor. And in the corridor is a stone box, and in the box are six skeletons, the remains of souls who were sacrificed to protect the person for whom this temple was built. But he still doesn't know who that person was. And then he finally sees a huge door, a massive triangular stone, so his men and he open it, and then they go in. And behind this huge triangular door is a vaulted crypt about 30 feet long and 23 feet high. And inside the crypt is this massive sarcophagus carved from one piece of limestone. And on top of this sarcophagus is this magnificent lid with these expertly carved images of a king. Along this edge, by the way, which is covered with cinnabar, this red stuff, is poison to the touch to keep looters from coming in here and ruining it. And by the way, if the ancient Egyptians might have used this, we might have had more antiquities coming out of that country today. But along this edge is the image of a shield, and up in the sanctuary is another image of a shield. And the ancient Maya word for shield is pakal. So Alberto Rus had discovered the tomb of the most important Maya king, Pakal the Great. Pakal's ascension to the throne in 615 AD came during the most critical time for Palenque. With no direct heir, the elders of Palenque had turned to an outsider, a royal who lived outside the kingdom named Lady Sakkuk. Now she returned to Palenque with her adolescent son, Pakal. The future of Palenque hung in the balance as the young boy was crowned king by his mother. He was just 12 years old. She sort of kept the throne warm for him for over 10 years while he was growing up. As the young king grew into adulthood, 
Pakal had to deify himself to legitimize his rule. He declared his mother to be the living embodiment of the first mother, who created humans and the gods. He then was the son of a goddess, an exalted position that removed any question of his legitimacy. He was almost certainly a charismatic fellow. He had to have been. He had no power base. He had to do it almost on pure charisma and determination. As a Johnny-come-lately, as someone who needs to prove himself, he's going to be as splashy as possible. And so he constructs the most gaudy buildings imaginable. He's establishing all sorts of new architectural patterns. To authenticate his lineage, Pakal set off on a building spree to revitalize his battered kingdom. One of his first orders of business, the renovation and expansion of the royal palace, an impressive structure that sits in the heart of the main plaza. More than 70,000 square feet, the palace would become a maze of galleries, chambers, stairways, courtyards, and tunnels, and was designed to reflect his ideas of grandeur. At first, Pakal's architects, like those throughout the Maya world, employed what is called the corbelled vault to support their soaring structures. Now, this was a, a pretty straightforward um, structure where uh, a series of lines of stones of ever-decreasing height are laid on top of each other. So it forms really a kind of inverted V shape uh, with a row of capstones along the top. But the corbelled vault left something to be desired. This basic construction limited interior space and light and forced architects to build walls wider than even the space it enclosed. Driven by a determined king, Pakal's engineers now looked for solutions to this problem. What the Palenque designers succeeded in doing was lightening the weight. Um, they produced sort of honeycomb structures on the top of these buildings. They could make their spans wider area, more light could come in. These innovations reduced the stress on the load-bearing walls, creating a more open and inviting feel than the traditional Maya buildings. Over 60 years, Pakal's builders became the best in the new world. But it wasn't until the end of his rule that Pakal commissioned one of the most complex and imaginative projects ever attempted by the Maya, the Temple of the Inscriptions. The discovery of the Temple of the Inscriptions changed all our ideas about Maya pyramids. They weren't supposed to be uh, mortuary uh, shrines. Inside, along a stairway leading down to the tomb, engineers built a psychoduct, or hollow tube. It's a conduit that allows someone on the top of the pyramid to speak into this speaking tube, and eventually you would be able to presumably communicate directly with uh, Pakal in his tomb. This 20-ton sarcophagus was built to last an eternity. This actually had a lid which was rolled off to one side, and there was a cavity for his body to be put, so that when he eventually did die, the door was sealed and the stairway was blocked. His architects and sculptors designed a coffin rich in symbolism, portraying the resurrection of Pakal in the afterworld. Royal scribes were ordered to draw a grid to accommodate 640 glyphs that would tell the story of Pakal's reign. Many Maya pyramids don't leave much textual record on them. The opposite is the case in the Temple of the Inscriptions. Everything about it, from these huge tablets on the summit to the information inside, proclaims that this is the final resting place of the founder of one of the great Maya dynasties. In 683, during Pakal's 68th year as king, the 12-year-old boy who grew to be one of the great Maya rulers died at the age of 80. He was covered in red cinnabar and adorned in lavish jewelry. A jade mask was placed over his face. Though the legacy of Pakal the Great would be hard to match, his son had been waiting on the sidelines for nearly 50 years. With the clock ticking, he would launch a series of building projects harnessing the laws of physics and Mother Nature. Six eighty-four A.D. 
The mighty King Pakal has engineered Palenque to be one of the finest Maya capitals ever known. After 68 years on the throne, his body is buried in a tomb that rivals those built for the Egyptian pharaohs. Now it is up to his son to build upon his father's legacy and cement his own reign. His name was Khan Balam. Pakal was the founder of a dynasty, but his son was a great consolidator. He was someone that was going to make sure that that dynasty would continue. The 48-year-old king immediately threw himself into an ambitious three-pyramid complex that would stand as his own monument for the ages. He designed and constructed uh, the cross group, one of the most intricate and beautiful groups of ceremonial temples ever constructed in the Maya world. These are his memorial, and they tower above the palace. They look down on the works of his father, and in some ways, I think they represent a statement of individuality that he himself is going to leave his imprint on the city just as his father did. He ordered his engineers to build three intricate structures, the Temple of the Cross, the Temple of the Foliated Cross, and the Temple of the Sun. Khan Balam's engineers would take a giant leap forward using sophisticated geometric calculations unsurpassed anywhere in the world based on the Maya's creation of a complete number system. One of the many ways in which the Maya were ahead of their time was in their creation of what we would refer to as zero. With a similar combination of a, of a shell which represented zero or completion and then a dot number one and then a five by just we were placing them in different positions. They were able to multiply, you know, uh, and reach incredible numbers. The uh, Greeks and Romans were tremendous engineers, uh, theologians, historians, and so forth, but were very limited by their mathematical system because they didn't have a zero. So here you have the irony that they were able to gr produce great public works, philosophy, and whatnot, but were really pretty lousy mathematicians compared to the Maya. Khan Balam's engineers' advanced mathematical observations may have included the discovery of proportions like the square roots of rectangles and something called the golden mean, a naturally occurring proportion that can be seen in animals, nature, and even the human body as 1 to 1.618. Measure a person from his head to his belly button, and then from his belly button to his feet, you get a proportion very close to 1 to 1.618, the golden mean. Some scholars believe this proportion has been appearing in structures for thousands of years at places like the Pyramids of Giza in Egypt and the Parthenon in Greece. Da Vinci's Vitruvian Man is a study of this proportion, and some even say he painted the Mona Lisa using this ratio in her features. With nothing more than some sticks and a cord, Khan Balam's engineers may have been able to measure the square roots of rectangles. In the Temple of the Cross, these shapes would be used to mark the two main piers of the facade, the width of the medial doorway and the interior walls. The golden ratio can be seen in the rear chambers and the base of the structure with the side wall as one and the back wall as 1.618. By using repeated squares and natural proportions in the Temple of the Cross, a beautifully calculated floor plan took shape, full of geometry, mythological history, and a king's own legacy. But not all engineering in Palenque was done with an eye on the afterlife. Palenque's engineers also had to focus on more practical needs. One of the names of Palenque is La Camha, which means place of great waters. Um, we have four rivers running through Palenque year-round. We have dozens of springs. We have water everywhere. These riches came with challenges. Palenque was surrounded by steep hills, natural springs and creeks that carved their way through the base of the site, leaving only bits and pieces of flat, water-free land for building. Unlike most Maya cities, the problem facing Palenque wasn't how to store water for the dry season, 
It was how to deal with an overabundance of water. As you can see, everything is green here. It rains every day. So to meet this challenge, the city planners devised a unique way of diverting the pre-existing streams by building subterranean aqueducts that would channel the water underground, thus saving more land on top for cultivation. These tunnels were lined with limestone and they were covered with our old friend from Egypt and Greece, the Corbel Vault. Series of protruding stones, one on top of the other, formed sort of an arch overhead. Now these ceilings were so sturdy, they could support the massive weight of Palenque's giant plazas overhead. So the people were walking along with the water rushing underneath them, being diverted away from the city, just like it is where I live today in New York City. What's even more impressive is that there are signs that Maya engineers may have figured out a way to create water pressure. They built water tunnels that ran through the rugged terrain into the city, often directed uphill. As they got closer to the main structures, the pipes got incrementally smaller. Like Roman fountains, the water pressure gained momentum as it coursed through increasingly narrower tunnels, eventually allowing for running water throughout Palenque's buildings. We have beautiful systems of, of sweat baths and swimming pools and aqueduct in its day. It would have rivaled any of the Roman aqueduct systems. We don't see this use of, of water pressure anywhere else, and it doesn't appear again until the Spanish bring the technologies with them. Together, Khan Balam and his father Pakal ruled Palenque for nearly 100 years, pushing Maya engineering to a level never seen before. The future seemed bright for this city on the rise, but its years of glory are about to come to a sudden end. Something is happening in the Maya world that will cause the classic city-states to implode. By the 8th century, Palenque, Tikal, and the other kingdoms of the Maya world were expanding across the continent. Tall pyramids, unparalleled city planning, and sumptuous royal palaces advertised the glory of the great kings. Then, suddenly, these cities began to unravel, one after another. Royal sculptors stopped carving their monuments with historical information, and kings halted their construction projects. Maya civilization had plunged into darkness. It's not that the entire Maya lowlands is abandoned overnight. It's that, you know, one kingdom falls here, and another one ten years later falls over here, then another one over here. The causes of the Maya collapse remains a great debate among scholars. We're really talking about a society that was pushing itself to the limits. There is no one single explanation for this implosion, but scholars seem to believe that environmental catastrophe led to a full-blown meltdown for the Maya civilization. The soil no longer produced crops, thus lack of food and polluted water produced malnutrition and disease. The Maya could no longer count on their kings to intercede with their gods because their great society was in a death spiral, and their kings, so long counted on for guidance and prosperity, were powerless to stop it. So sadly, but slowly and surely, the people voted with their feet, and the ancient Maya left their beautiful cities forever. There were no signs of mass graves. They did not vanish. Where did the millions of Maya go? If you wanted to go where it was happening, you moved north. Go, go north, young man. The cities that die in the south, and that's the only way to describe it, is they just go into oblivion are never really replaced but there are locations all around the Yucatan Peninsula where the cities not only thrive but they begin to grow explosively. This growth was enhanced by an elaborate network of causeways called sacbays or white roads. The sacbays weren't just local transport they were emblems of the great political power of two allied cities that had the wherewithal to create this magnificent royal procession way between their two kingdoms. As much as 60 miles long in some places, they were a marvel of engineering. They would place huge rocks on both sides of the causeway and then filling whatever was in between with 
cobbles and unfinished rocks and the stones and then they cover all this surface with stucco nice plaster and then upon it they create this smooth surface in the yucatan peninsula the sock bays often charted a course through the rough terrain in perfectly straight lines it's not easy to cut a line 60 miles that doesn't deviate even a, even a degree I would really like to know uh, what instruments they use. We have no record of it. These causeway systems allowed for rebirth, movement, and trade in the north. And it is there that the ragged survivors of the southern lowlands hope to find a second chance in a Yucatan city called Chichen Itza. Chichen Itza came to be the largest and most powerful city from about 800 to 1050 or so that had a real knack of being a big tent. So it was a very cosmopolitan place, and I'm sure it traded handsomely on that reputation. One of the buildings unique to the site was El Caracol, an astronomical observatory. The Maya were obsessed with both time and the stars and spent centuries looking to the sky for answers. The Maya probably had something called a gnomon, which is uh, a series of two crossed bars. And by looking at the intersection of those two bars, they were able to focus on something. With just basic tools, the Maya were able to track the movement of the stars and planets and the passing of time. Like Stonehenge, this was a place where people could make solar and lunar observations. The staircase in the front of the building faced 27.5 degrees northwest, out of line with other structures, but in almost perfect alignment with Venus's most northerly position in the sky. It was closely aligned with the celestial bodies and occurrences, such as the movement of Venus and the solstices. In the higher tower of the building, three openings survive today. They are small, narrow, and irregularly placed, but they align along astronomical sight lines. In the Caracol, we can see in its orientations, in its peculiar displacements, in its odd alignment of buildings, a focus on what Venus was doing at the time. Venus is a kind of variable uh, actor up there in the skies. Sometimes it moves in this direction, sometimes it moves in that direction. The caracol seems to be about looking at Venus when it's come to the end of a certain kind of motion. This astute astronomical observation allowed the Maya to build their interlocking calendars that were more accurate than any other used in the ancient world. The Maya had two calendars, one ritual and then, you know, the the solar calendar that is, that is very, very similar to what we use in the Western world. The Maya measured the solar year to be 365 days. Their measurements for the revolution of Venus and the occurrence of lunar eclipses were equally on target. In just 200 years, the Maya had achieved a rebirth in the wake of the catastrophic destruction of their southern cities, but now the North would face an even deadlier enemy, one that was capable of annihilating the Maya while leaving their cities intact. In the ninth century, the classic Maya cities suddenly and mysteriously collapsed, ending the era of greatest prosperity and growth. Rebirth in the North gave the Maya an opportunity to combine astronomy and engineering on an unprecedented scale. At Chichen Itza, signs of continuing obsession with the skies left a permanent mark on Maya architecture. The cornerstone of Chichen Itza was the 98-foot El Castillo, or the castle, built in the 9th or 10th century. The 365 steps equal the number of days in the Maya civil calendar. 52 panels on each side represented the Maya's 52-year cycle. Nine terraced levels equaled the 18-month Maya solar calendar. And the temple's axis was perfectly aligned so that specific shadows were cast twice a year. For any Maya standing in, uh, and looking at the northwestern sector of the Castillo, they would see a balustrade 
and then a combination of shadows and the sun hitting that part just before sunset and then several triangles form and then at the very bottom of, the, of this balustrade you have a nice carved serpent head a snake coming down from heaven and that is indicating the arrival of the rainy season. The Maya saw this phenomenon as a manifestation of the deity Kukul Khan, the feathered serpent. The Mayas were able to actually record, you know, the equinox. That day in the year where night and day, you know, last the same. Every year, March 21st, you see the descent of Kukul Khan. Surrounding El Castillo, the civic buildings took on a new characteristic, spaciousness with a broad open plaza, temples, marketplaces, a ball court, and colonnades. So the colonnade hall not only house uh, this, the, the feasting events, but maybe individuals were brought into the plaza. You know, the general public was probably invited, depending on the occasions, to come to the plaza and witness the arrival of these, you know, uh, traders, uh, the merchants. Greek or Roman in appearance, these round columns were used as a new type of structural support and were an architectural first in the Maya world. The benefit of a column is that it allows you to create flat roofs. You're not investing all of your energy in creating stone buildings that are going to be containing corbel vaults which may or may not collapse. The columns were simple in design. Round drums were placed one on top of the other, filled with rubble in between. A square section was placed at the top, and then flat rooftops made of stucco and wood were added to form expansive covered interiors. It involves people more openly in the life of, what, of the building and of what's happening within it than would have been possible with Maya pyramids of the full classic period. Those pyramids are mostly about exclusivity. It's about showing a space, holding it up high, but allowing very, very few people to look into it. The open column structures are much more inviting. But the welcoming atmosphere didn't last long. After more than 200 years of domination over the Yucatan, Chichen Itza suffered a fate similar to its neighbors in the south. It mysteriously collapsed. When the Spanish arrived on the shores of the Yucatan Peninsula in 1517, every large cosmopolitan center of the Maya world had been abandoned. Even so, a splintered Maya civilization, living in small villages across the countryside, put up a sustained fight against the conquistadors. They proved difficult to conquer because, rather than taking a king captive or an emperor, as they did with the Aztec, they had to conquer one village at a time. And once they moved on to the next village, there'd be one behind them that would then uh, begin to rise in revolt. Maya warriors killed conquistadors by the thousands, but their weapons proved useless against a more potent enemy, disease. Within a hundred years, 90% of the population of the New World was gone. The Maya who survived faced further persecution. Friar Diego de Landa had been sent from Spain to convert the Maya to Christianity, and he ruthlessly enforced his religious teachings. Diego de Landa was a young idealist who came to the New World trying to save souls, trying to win converts to what he referred to as the one true faith. But the Maya didn't believe that they should instantly and forevermore reject all of their own beliefs. On July 12, 1562, Landa ordered an auto de fe, or burning of the Maya texts, believing they were the writing of the devil. This was the end of thousands of years of accumulated knowledge of Maya civilization, one of the great tragedies in human history. In a lucky twist of fate, Four codices survived the inferno and wear and tear of time. By the 19th century, some of these books that happened to escape the clutches of these friars and their destructive urges began to make their way into public attention. Today, their survival story is just another mystery 
in the complex history of the Maya. The fact that they were able to sustain an urban civilization in the rainforest for 1,500